Hey, it's me again, AJ Hartley. Um, I recently uh, posted a little video about my most recent novel called uh, Impervious, and a number of people responded. Um, and I thought that I would go back over my previous books and talk about things that interested me about them or things that I liked about them or whatever. And uh, I thought maybe a good place to start was with my first novel. Not the first novel I wrote. I wrote a lot of things before I was published. But my first published novel, which was this. It's called The, the Mask of Atreus. Uh, it came out 15 years ago. Um, and uh, to be honest, I'm a little surprised that I'm still talking about it, given how many books I've done. I've done like, I don't know, 24 or something at this point. Um, and this is one of those books where it seemed very much of its moment, but um, which has stayed a little more relevant than I would have liked, um, because it's a book about neo-Nazis. So, you know, that's fun. Um, <laughs> I had been writing for 20 years. I'd been writing long fiction um, since I was 19. I'd written eight complete novels in various genres because I read in lots of genres, so I tend to write lots of different things. I write whatever I feel like writing, much to my agent's frustration, I'm sure. Uh, and um, I had recently acquired my present agent, uh, Stacy Glick, at um, what was then Distal and Godrich. Uh, and this was the third novel that I ran by her. She signed me on the basis of a previous one, which we couldn't sell. Then I wrote a mystery, which we couldn't sell. And then I wrote this. And, and this grew out of a number of different things. Um, some of which are connected to the way that the book then subsequently performed. Um, because a good chunk of the book is set in Greece. Uh, as I said, it's called The Mask of Atreus, and I, I had always been fascinated by, by Greece and ancient Greek uh, archaeology, specifically. I've been to Greece many times, um, from when I was sort of an adolescent, and then, you know, recently as well. And there are places that I absolutely loved, like Delphi and... Um, and Mycenae. And I had been doing some archaeological reading about Schliemann's 19th century digs. Schliemann was the guy who uh, discovered Troy, you know, when a lot of people thought that Troy didn't exist. Schliemann was the guy who, who went out there and, and found it and used and claimed that he had proved the Homeric myths to be accurate, you know. Uh, and a lot of what he did was turned out to be sort of sketchy, but you know he still made some, uh, um, you know, major discoveries and achievements. Though there was also a ton of stuff that kind of mysteriously went missing. Um, and I don't want to spoil the story too much, but this is a story about what happened to some of it—a a fictional account, though it's rooted in actual history. Uh, and some of the stuff tied expressly to um, the Second World War because Schliemann basically stole some of the things that he found. These were sort of ancient Bronze Age stuff, you know, but, but spectacular gold and uh, death masks and, and various other things, some of which, as I say, disappeared. His wife was photographed in the, the jewels um, of, that he found that he, he thought belonged to the, the family of Agamemnon and um, uh, and uh, parts of the House of Atreus, which is what the novel is about. And so a lot of this stuff mysteriously disappeared. It seems like he sent it back to Germany without declaring it to the local Turkish authorities. Uh, and then it was kept secret until Berlin was quote unquote liberated by the Russians on, in this case. And then some of the stuff was rediscovered and then disappeared to Russia. Uh, so, you know, this is a, a contemporary novel set in the present day, but with its uh, roots 
in the Second World War and in obviously much, much more ancient history as well, which is there as a kind of archaeological presence. And it was also inspired uh, not just by my recent revisiting Mycenae and, and other places uh, in Greece, but it was also inspired by my reading um, um, a book on the 761st Tank Battalion called Band of Brothers by Karim Abdul-Jabbar, uh, which is a, a, a historical account of the only black tank battalion uh, to serve in the Second World War, which is fascinating to me as a sort of military, somebody who's always been interested in, in military history and Second World War history particularly. And the, the book that emerged was a sort of weird combination of these wildly different things, ancient Greece and, and ancient Greek history, along with the Second World War, and then this other stuff about uh, um, racial politics, which has always um, shaped some of the things that I've been interested in. Um, and the story is told from the perspective of a woman called Deborah Miller, who is a very tall uh, Jewish um, museum curator. Uh, and I wanted to, you know, obviously in, in some ways this was a kind of Indiana Jones sort of story, but I wanted it to be a bit more grounded in actual history and actual archaeological practice and in some, you know, potentially serious things, which included the persistence of the Nazi ideology in 21st, in, in 21st century America. As I said, I didn't realize that would be still something that we were talking about quite so much um but we are so so this seems like a good story to talk about um so it was a sort of odd confluence of things and the result was a pretty hefty thriller i, I mean you know in this edition you know it's nearly 400 pages which for a thriller is quite substantial um and has a lot of moving parts. It takes place in a lot of different places. There are historical flashbacks, um, but it's still an adventure. Um, and when it went on the market, you know, as I said, um, I'd been submitting for a long time, um, and I, I had a, a, an, an agent that I trusted. Uh, but you know, we'd already run a couple of books out that year uh, without any success. Um, and yeah, now that I think about it, this was also the, the year that my, my son was born. Um, my son was born in fairly traumatic circumstances. He was massively premature and was in intensive care for six weeks. And I was due to stay home with him from work, uh, in that first year, um, and it was one of those moments where I, I realized that I couldn't spend the time that I had been doing on this little scribbling writing hobby because I had other people dependent on me and I just couldn't justify it. I couldn't justify the time. I wasn't making any money. I hadn't made any money off it for 20 years, not a cent. Um, so, you know, it, it, I now had a, I, I now had a family to, to look after, and um, it just didn't make sense. Um, but I gave myself permission, or my wife gave me permission, because she knew that this stuff was important to me. Uh, and I said privately to myself, I said, okay, I'm going to give it a year. And hopefully I can sell something this year. So I wrote three books. And as I said, the first one got me my agent. Um, but didn't sell. The second one didn't sell. And then this one sold weirdly. Um, I remember coming back from a meeting at the university where I was teaching and there was a, a phone call from my agent and I knew immediately that something good and weird had happened. I could tell in her voice. And the good thing was that we had sold the Mask of Atreus. The weird thing is, was that we had sold it in Greece, which doesn't happen, you know, in uh, in publishing. Generally speaking, you sell it in your own market, your domestic market, and if 
that raises enough attention, then you'll get other countries, uh, other publishing houses overseas expressing interest or, you know, agreeing to take a look at it and see whether they, they think it will work in, over there. So it's very, very unusual to sell a book in a foreign market before you sell it in your domestic market. And I don't, I still don't really know how that happened. Obviously the book had a lot of Greek connection. So um, there was reason for that kind of, but it then started a weird chain reaction. I think we sold it in several countries, Brazil and I want to say like Lithuania or somewhere, somewhere like that, some s small bizarre market before we sold it in the U S before we sold it to Penguin at Berkeley in the U S and then it just kept selling, you know, and, um, you know, this is the Danish edition and this is the Polish edition and this is the Hebrew edition you can see a sort of running <laughs> theme in terms of cover art everybody was doing basically the same thing uh, and you know I think all told in the end we sold in 28 languages uh, which has never happened to me since so this was my first novel and suddenly it was like this international phenomenon or rather people thought that it was going to be and that I think is the key because you know why well uh, because I was still um, without meaning to without in intending to or even really being conscious of it I was writing the Da Vinci Code and the Da Vinci Code had been out I think for a couple of years at that point uh, this was we sold it in 2005 Da Vinci Code had been out a little while and it created this market for uh, archaeological secret uh, global mysteries, you know. Um, and that's why this book sold in ways that my previous efforts hadn't, I think. Um, and it's why a lot of foreign markets wanted to jump on it as being something that was going to be a big book. And it wasn't. In truth, you know, I mean, it it it, it sold pretty well, uh, particularly I think it sold pretty well here. Certainly enough to get me to do another two or three of those books. Uh, th that style of book, I'll talk about those later another time. But I don't think, but it wasn't the, the blockbuster in Europe, particularly that people perhaps thought that it might be, and I think that was partly because that Da Vinci Code market, which had exploded with so many people writing those kind of stories. And many of them were not very good, let's be honest, you know, uh, and in certain respects, the Da Vinci Code's not very good, but it tapped into certain things that people really liked and, there were, and, it, and it did a certain kind of storytelling very effectively. Those short chapters that kept making you want to keep going, the, the way it dangled little mysteries and possibilities and the and the idea that when you get to the end of the book, there would be some big revelation that was a real revelation, not just a, a surprise within the story, but a surprise that would change the way you thought about the world. That was what the Da Vinci Code promised. Whether you think that delivered it, it was delivered is another question entirely. But that's the way it worked. And that's the way a lot of these books work. That some secret was going to be revealed. Um, and the truth is that I think, you know, by the time my book came out, the market was already saturated and people were kind of sick of it and were starting to move on. And, and and there are still writers, still people successfully writing those kinds of stories, but they are very, very few these days. Mostly that market has just gone away. Um, but the Da Vinci, uh, the, but Mask of Atreus was, the, was the book that, that launched my career. So, you know, I'm not going to, I'm not going to mock it. And there are things about that book that I'm still, proud of. There was an intricacy to the plotting um, and the attempt, something that I have always done, <laughs> for better or worse, to marry um, a popular form with the attempt to explore things that I think are real and serious, you know, um, even in, in a kind of adventure or mystery sort of context. The other thing about this, and this also speaks to a couple of questions that I've had recently is that it was the, the first um, published book of mine that 
specifically dealt with the representation of race and gender. Um, I, why do I do this? I don't know, and, and it's hard, and it's potentially troublesome, controversial. Um, but yeah, the, the protagonist of my first novel was a tall Jewish woman, which I am not. And um, I did a lot of reading, a lot of research, and I talked to Jewish friends to try and ground that character and her perspective. Um, it's not an accident that she was very tall, because um, I'm quite tall, and I wanted her to feel like from certain people's perspective she wasn't sufficiently feminine because that gave me a way to get in to thinking of her simply as a person a person who did not fit conventional gender stereotypes does that make sense um and that has always appealed to me i think you know growing up in in working class industrial england i'm conscious that i didn't always fit conventional stereotypes about masculinity either uh, so um, maybe that was my way in uh, and so and trying to focus on her simply as a consciousness as a human thinking person who felt a little outside the norm for various reasons that w fits with me I can I can do that um, uh, it's also a story that has um, a, 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 pro a prominent black character in it as well um again whether I, I you know I, I i did my best i don't think i think i'd do it better now and the truth is that i i know how to ask the right questions now um but i think that there's value there's value to the story i think and um and it was satisfying to 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 tell an adventure and a mystery that was tapping into um, to issues of race uh, and and the sort of larger political um, ramifications and the scariness of that. So yeah, so um, I don't know that I have much else to say about this right now, and I'm conscious that I don't want these videos to be too long. Um, this was the first of four I had some centered on Deborah Miller and some centered on another character that I created after that called Thomas Knight um, and they sort of start to intersect in in the uh, in the next three books um, they're a bit baroque they're a bit overly plotted a bit uh, um, a bit broad a bit in terms of their their geographical reach and their attempt to sort of wrestle with big historical things and travel all over the world and 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 deal with big ideas as well as you know people coming after you with a gun uh but that was the form that was the genre they're not terribly they look realist but in many ways they're not in any way that you know most um thriller uh movies and such are not particularly realist when you really really come down to it but uh i think you know it, it was that's how I got started and um, so I'm, I'm proud of it and um, you can still get them uh, they're not available at the moment in paperback um, they are available as ebooks and on audio so they're still out there so yes if you get a chance check out the mask of atreus and um if you don't like it it's because i wrote it a long time ago and therefore can't be blamed for it and if you do great thanks i'm gonna leave it at that bye